Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us for the segment, we have Marshall Hain, our co-founder and CEO of Metallicus and board member of the Dogecoin Foundation, Andrew Carey, co-founder and CEO of Gold ATM, as well as Austin Strong, CEO of Tab Bank. They join me to discuss the future of banking and how TradFi and fintechs should coexist. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. Let's quickly go around the horn here. Um, we'll start with you, Marshall. If you could just give us a brief description of where you sit within the financial ecosystem ecosystem. Thanks for having me on, Jill. Um, as you know, uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Metallicus. Uh, in, in the crypto space, uh, Metallicus is working on integrating traditional finance and decentralized finance where it previously didn't uh, work together. Uh, we work with uh, banks and financial institutions in building private ledgers and connecting them to the public ledger uh, through our banking innovation program with Metal Blockchain. Um, and we, we've been around for a little while. We started in 2016 um, uh, at the kind of the early days of crypto, I guess you could call it. Um, and our goal is to build the world's most customer centric digital asset banking network. All right. And Andrew, tell us about Gold ATM. Hey, nice to be here, Jill. Really appreciate it. Uh, gold ATM is essentially the world's first truly gold ATM. And it does probably what you think it does. It sells gold. Now, we don't sell traditional gold bars or gold coins out of the ATM. Uh, these ATMs dispense gold bills. They look and feel kind of like real cash. Um, they're 99.99% 24-karat gold. And essentially, you can buy small amounts of gold, as little as $20. And our mission is to make gold easy and accessible for everyday people. As you know, you've seen some of the news with Costco recently selling $200 million of gold just last quarter. Uh, on, on record uh, sales to maybe do a billion dollars in gold sales. But those are gold bars with typically high entry barriers of $2,000 plus per gold bar. Our goal is to give gold accessibility to everyday people for as little as $20. And that's what the gold ATM accomplishes. All right. And um, Austin, tell us about Tab Bank. Yeah, thanks, Jill. Since 1998, Transportation Alliance Bank, or Tab, has made its mark as one of the nation's first truly online banks. Our mission is to build bold financial solutions that lift and empower our customers and to serve the underserved. Historically, uh, we've operated with uh, over the road truck and trailer operators and others in the transportation space uh, more recently and into the future, we serve a variety of small and medium-sized businesses and individuals and families throughout the nation. We try to meet them where they have needs on their financial journey towards success. So, Marshall, how are you influencing the future of banking through Metallicus, and, and what do you believe the future will look like? Yeah, so I believe the future of banking will directly integrate with decentralized ledger. I, I saw this, I guess you could say, 15 years ago at the advent of when Bitcoin first came about. Uh, the early crypto ecosystem believed that uh, cryptocurrency was something that would be against the banks, where I saw that this was a new emerging asset class and would ultimately improve banking technology through giving more transparency, interoperability, and putting users more in charge of their data and ownership. Um, and so for us, we saw that opportunity at Metallicus to help bridge that uh, that gap between traditional finance and blockchain. Uh, traditionally, it, this the bank moves slow and blockchain moves very, very quickly. So these are two things that are kind of have been at odds with each other. Uh, Metallicus and, and the work that we do is trying to decipher that and make it simple and also make it compliant, build the regulation technology directly into the decentralized ledger, something that previously wasn't something that people really discussed in the space so much, and now is becoming something uh, more and more popular as we see larger financial institutions and banks enter uh, the decentralized ledger and private ledger as well. So basically marrying the speed of technology with the scalability of a traditional financial institution is what it sounds like. That's correct, yes. Okay. Andrew, so many questions for you here. Um, why create gold ATMs? Tell me about some of the logistics here. Um, how many of them exist? How are you printing? Well, not printing, but creating these, these more accessible 
bills, if you will. And then how are people using them? Is it a form of currency? Is it more of, of an investment? Yeah, um, I think the world in general is heading towards more automation. We're seeing tons of major Fortune 100s and Fortune 500s uh, retailers invest in more automation within their retail footprint. Uh, the kiosk model is a tie and trusted model. Um, we, our pedigree comes from the Bitcoin ATM space. In fact, uh, our company, BitcoinATM.com, uh, is the software provider to the uh, largest amount of Bitcoin ATMs um, in the world. And we took a lot of that knowledge and we distilled it down into another sound money, gold, which is roughly 10 times the market cap of Bitcoin and a lot more familiar to the average person. However, a lot less accessible in terms of the physical gold. Most people are familiar with buying an ETF or buying paper gold derivatives. Um, we want to give people access to the real thing, uh, the physical gold. And we want to make it as simple as, hey, I can go down the street uh, to a local grocery store store or shopping mall and buy $20 worth of gold. And that allows people to do some things that they weren't previously able to do, like dollar cost average into physical gold, which is like almost unheard of. And the kiosk format makes it easy and palatable to fit within the mental model of the average person. And it makes it economically scalable. That way we can sell as little as $20 of gold. Before that, it just wasn't possible. Right. So this is a store of value in investment. You're not going to walk to your local 7-Eleven and buy a Slurpee, right? I mean, there, there's no way to exchange. You'd actually be surprised. There's actually roughly over 2,000 brick and mortar stores right now that accept gold backs, uh, which is the product we dispense out of these gold ATMs. And many, many states, in fact, roughly half of the states right now either have enacted species legal tender laws. Um, or are in the process of enacting species legal tender legislation to allow people to essentially uh, exchange goods and services for voluntary forms of value, such as gold and silver. And what these gold bills do is that they make it a lot more practical to transact with gold. And I think we're also at the beginning of tokenization of real world assets, especially gold and silver. And I think it's 2013 all over again, like in the early Bitcoin days, where total tokenization of gold right now is roughly at a $1.5 billion market cap, you can expect a lot more gold to come online and take a page out of the Bitcoin book. And we expect that to grow rapidly over the next five to 10 years, probably exceeding a trillion dollar market cap. All right. Interesting. Appreciate the insight there. Austin, why are simplicity and customer friendly solutions important for banks in the future? Yeah, I think this is really an interesting group. I think... These are some bold financial solutions that are that we're talking about today. I think we can't forget about why simple and easy is so important for the customer. For example, at Tab, we we feel like a solution needs to be easily understandable. The value proposition needs to be as presented in the marketing presentation, right? So for example, at Tab, we take some pretty simple solutions and offer a pretty um, good value proposition. For example, we have what's called Tab Save and Tab Spend. So Tab Save is a high yield checking account and Tab Spend is a high yield spending account. Um, sorry, Tab, Tab Save is a high yield savings account. Tab Spend is a high yield checking account. In the savings account, we offer just a simple 5.27% uh, interest rate. So if you put any amount of money in TAB, you get paid 5.27%. It's simple. It's easy. It's understandable. It's There's no minimum balance that you have to have. There's no maximum balance where your interest cuts off. If you want to use that money to spend it, you transfer it over to your high yield spending account where you earn 3.5%. And every swipe that you make, that you make on your card, you earn a 1% cash back. This is the kind of bold financial solution that we think is going to be important in the future. That for TAB, we feel like we can easily send a message that's simple, easy to use, and it's ads advertised. There's no gimmicks or hidden fees. This is the kind of bold solutions we think that you pair with simplicity to make a difference now and in the future. Banking. Austin, how can fintechs offer substantially higher rates than your traditional money center can? I, I mean, you know, it, it, my traditional checking account or savings account is like 0.01%, right? Whereas, uh, you know, I leverage 
accounts such as yours where I'm getting four and a half, four point seven five percent, how are you they how why does that disparity exist? Well, it it it, it happens because you to be able to offer that, you actually have to lend in and work in a little bit more of a risky space. So we try to serve the underserved, right? Typically, they're underserved because there is a little bit more risk there. And so as we serve that population, we start with accounts as low as like a $30,000 line of credit for a small business. And we go as high as a $15 million working capital facility. So we start with that business when they're small and we say, we're going to help you when you're small, when you need money and when nobody else is, is offering to serve you, the rates are, will be a little bit higher for that. Uh, but as you grow, we provide the next product for you to grow your small business with us. And then the yield goes down and you start to see that you are succeeding financially over time with that higher yield then we can turn around and offer a little bit more to our customers that are depositing money at our bank. And so there's a business model that works here. And we think that there's a large population that benefits that is, has largely been underserved and will continue to be in the future. Marshall, do you foresee a time when digital currency will be trusted enough to play a core role in the global economy? What do you think that would look like? Absolutely. I, I think it's already arrived. It's just so early, it's hard to see uh, how big it will become. Uh, so if you look at the Bitcoin ETFs that were approved recently, um, they're growing rapidly into the double digits and soon, I believe, will be into the triple di uh, digit billions. Um, it's only a matter of time, in my opinion, before tokenized digital assets on the public and private ledgers breach $1 trillion. Um, and I think that that will be a, a tremendous moment. When you look at uh, tokenized assets, for example, the BlackRock uh, Biddle Fund, I think it's very interesting because you have traditional finance tokenizing uh, assets and products that were previously available behind the desk or you know, uh, not on the, the public ledger. Now they are available on the public ledger. They're quickly growing. And you're seeing some of the, the larger, for example, the top four banks and larger institutions entering. But for example, we have over 4,000 uh, banks in the United States. We have over 5,000, uh, 4,000 regional banks, over 5,000 credit unions. Um, and they're very much interested in faster payments, tokenization of assets. And so as you see the rest of the banking system and other financial institutions come online in the U.S., uh, this is where you'll start to see small business integrate uh, blockchain-based payments, fiat currencies, for example, stable coins. Uh, small business merchants are paying 3% all the way down on their um, on, uh, on retail uh, transactions. Imagine a future where uh, we cash is digital. There isn't a transaction fee. It may be close to nothing or zero, and there are no chargebacks. Furthermore, uh, digital identity can give consumers more control and ownership of their personal information, something that's become uh, more and more a problem over the years. And as it pertains to uh, finance and uh, uh, digital finance, it, it will allow us more privacy and uh, more ownership. That also can build a strong relationship between the customer and small business. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see a complete uh, transformation of the digital landscape. If you look at 2020 with COVID, how we kind of got rid of ca um, cash and went to digital payments and even went away from uh, cards into tapless payments, uh, stable coins and blockchain is the new future. And it's the engine underneath it that I think many will be using and not realizing. Metallicus is working on building a lot of this technology through Metal Blockchain um, right. and our consumer apps. Right. Well, certainly as interoperability continues to improve with the blockchain infrastructure, I, I think that's really the catalyst behind it. And, and I feel as if you know, over the past two to three years, that inflection point with that interoperability being a real thing has, you know, helped to with institutional adoption and so forth. So, Andrew, let me ask you a question. If, if as more states start accepting the gold back bills as a, a legal form of alternative currency, how do you see that influencing the future of traditional banking? Great question. I think that many states are looking at uh, putting depository frameworks uh, for gold and silver uh, uh, in, in actually in, in codifying it statutorily 
Um, I think that it's not impossible to see banks holding gold uh, and allowing their customers to access uh, a lot of the banking services uh, and, and deposit and withdraw physical gold, convert it into tokenized gold that's held at the bank. So I don't think it's out of the question. I think we're entering a monetary renaissance where uh, sound money is going to sit alongside uh, government sovereign currencies. Um, and you're going to see, you know, the dollar uh, as a choice and maybe gold as a choice and Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies as a choice. And you get to decide where you want to put your faith, where you want to store your time. And I think that choice is important for every day people. And it's also about making sure that we don't leave people behind in that fast transition. Everybody likes to talk about what's going to change. But I'm actually, you know, over at goldatm.com and bitcoinatm.com, we're really more, mostly interested in what's not going to change. And what's not going to change is physical representations of money. It, they're very important from an anthropological standpoint. People need to feel and touch their money. They need to be able to see it. They need to be able to count it. And it's important that we make physical representations of sound money that's going to sit alongside the dollar, alongside the euro. And that's what our role is um, at the kiosk level. It's about making sure people have accessibility to physical manifestations of sound money so that way it can fit within their mental model, their framework, so they can easily use it and understand it properly uh, for the future. And that's what we're interested in. Right. And Austin, we'll give you the last word here. Why do smaller banks need to partner with fintechs to succeed in the future? Yeah, really good question. You know, smaller banks have a challenge, right? Um, the demand from consumers is that the experiences they have are seamless and easy. What we know from years of experience is that to create a seamless experience for a consumer or a small business is hard and it costs a lot of money and investment and it's a challenge and some smaller banks may not always have the budgets to, to do that in all areas for their customers. Fintechs, what they do really well is they take a focused approach to a vertical and they dedicate a lot of resources and time to make that a seamless experience and they do this extremely well. So what we think is that the partnership now and even more in the future, especially for smaller smaller banking institutions, needs to know how to partner well with financial technology companies. It needs to know how to exchange data in a timely manner and to connect with more than one fintech that is offering more than one really seamless solution for their customers. The bank has the expertise to be able to make sure that they're serving their customers in a compliant, safe and sound manner, that they're delivering the value that they promised in the marketing. And the FinTech has the ability to deliver that solution, that seamless solution. So we think that the combination of the two makes the future of banking, this is what's gonna be really valuable and gonna allow us even as small banks to provide a seamless solution to our customers and to do it in a way that's economically viable through partnerships. All right, gentlemen, appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.